Good afternoon, Littleton. My name is Cindy Napoli. I am chairperson of the Littleton Board of Selectmen. I am here today um, for another segment of Stop the Stigma, Start a Conversation. As you may recall, the Littleton Board of Selectmen, or the Select Board now, uh, one of our goals has been to help combat the opioid crisis in our community. And um, through that initiative, we created the Littleton Coalition Against Addiction. Um, one of the programs that we created through the Littleton Coalition Against Addiction is a segment called Stop the Stigma, Start a Conversation. Um, the Littleton Coalition Against Addiction has been managed through the Department of Elder and Human Services to provide addiction resources and community and mental health services to the town of Littleton. Additional information about those programs will be shared at the conclusion of this interview. Um, addiction is one of the most misunderstood and complex conditions a person can have, and many people really don't understand um, how a substance such as alcohol or drugs can take over a person, take over their life, um, to the point where they're, they face destitute and um, sacrifices that many of us can't understand or comprehend. To help um, combat the stigma that comes with addiction, I'm joined here today by um, two people who uh, one of you may recognize is Delisa Laterzo. She is a business owner in Littleton and a member of the planning board, as well as her son, Austin, who agreed, um, really uh, wanted to come on to this show and share his story with us. So thank you very much for being here with me today. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, maybe Austin, just if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and share with us your story. I don't know your story. Um, but I know that Lisa, uh, Delisa has spoken to me about um, your perseverance and what you overcame, and she's very proud of you. So thank you for being here today. Of course, of course. My pleasure. So yes, um, I struggled with addiction um, between the ages of 18 and 21, probably. Yeah. Um, and uh, I... I everyone would have agreed before my addiction began that I had a really bright future. Um, I was going to the University of Denver, um, but that quickly fell apart in 2011 um, because I began to go through a period of depression um, and I began to combat that depression with drugs. Um, so it started out with painkillers, mm -hmm. so opiates, which I know the entire country is struggling with now. Mm -hmm. And then it sort of graduated on to cocaine, barbiturates, um, things of that nature. Um, so it was a very dangerous sort of cocktail, but it, it extended on through uh, from 2011 to probably 2013, 14, um, and just got worse and worse and worse um, to the point where I had basically um, shunned my family. Mm -hmm. um, I, I uh, committed many, many uh, acts that I feel really, I regret to this day, mm -hmm. even, even though I'm cleaned up. Um, I stole from my parents. I stole from, from my family, friends too, I'm sure. Um, so it was an extremely uh, dark period in which I, I um, sort of lost um, my mooring. I lost who I was. Right, right. So Delisa, when did you first notice that something was off or something was wrong? When did you become concerned about Austin and his behavior? Probably soon after it became a problem because as Austin mentioned, he had always been a good kid. I mm -hmm. mean, I couldn't believe I had a kid who wasn't partying, who wasn't doing a lot of the things I had done at his age. Um, and, and then he just started really pulling away from, from me and his father, not talking as much. I put it up to just teenage angst. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think it's things started to disappear from the house. Okay. And you realize, you know, first you think, oh, maybe I just misplaced it. Mm -hmm. 
and then you start just putting the pieces together. And then I started finding little packs of, um, I think they had little Batman wings on mm -hmm. them or something. Yeah, like baggies, paraphernalia. Little ba yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and of course, would confront Austin because we had always had a very good relationship mm -hmm. with one another. And he would make up excuses or say that it was a friend or, mm -hmm. you know, it was always something. Right. And you finally reach a point when and, and so I talked to him about um, going and seeing the therapist. I mean, we went through all of those those stages, you right. know, and steps. And what you realize is, when your child is eighteen years old, there's not a whole heck of a lot you can do. Mm -hmm. Right. You can't force them to do anything. So while Austin would agree to go and see the therapist, mm -hmm. I'd find out later he didn't go. Right. Um, well, and if I can add, I think one of the principal issues is that. I, I was lying not only to the people around me, but as cliche as it sounds, I was lying to myself. Right. You know, I made excuses for myself. You know, I told myself and others that I know I didn't have a problem. I distinctly remember a friend of mine at the time who said, you know, you're a drug addict, right? And I said, um, and he was a drug addict wow. too, by the way. Okay. And I said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm just, you know, it's like a little fun. Right. And uh, that moment still haunts me because, man, was I ever. Right. I mean, <laughs> but I was just, I was in complete um, denial of that fact. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not being able to look at that, look at yourself in the mirror. Right. And for him to say that to you. Right. It's, it's really telling. Yes. Um, so you're not at school at this point anymore. You're at home now. In this, in this, now I'm, I'm, I graduated college and I, I recovered. You did graduate. Oh yeah, okay. went back to the University of Denver, graduated, you know, 4.0. Okay. Dean's list every single quarter. Okay. Now I'm about, I just actually got my visa to go to the London School of Economics for graduate school today. Okay. So it's been a complete turnaround. Right. So at what point did you hit rock bottom? Oh, I remember very, very specifically. Um, I was out of money um, and I hadn't spoken to either of my parents uh, for a couple months, um, nor my grandparents who also lived in the same town. I'd lost pretty much every friend. Um, I was living in my car okay. um, in a parking lot near uh, the ski resort in our, our town. And um, my car had broken down, I couldn't go anywhere. Um, and. I just remember thinking, what am I going to do? I mean, I remember having that conversation with myself, figuring out, will my parents forgive me? What will that call be like, you know, right. going through it in my head? And so I finally called, um, I think I called my dad first because no, called I called first. you first. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I made that call. I think we discussed on the phone, my mom and I, about next steps, you know, and the next step was going to Tennessee, which is where my dad lived. So getting out of, of the environment right. that had led me th to this place. Right. Then I called my dad and I remember just crying, you know, saying, you know, dad, I'm so sorry. And, you know, little things like, dad, I'm so sorry that we missed the NBA finals. <laughs> you know, right. LeBron did so well. All these little things because I had completely severed relationships, right, you know. Right, So, yeah, it was a very poignant moment that right. I, it's indelible, that, that memory. Right, right. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it was in, not interesting. It was um, heartbreaking as a parent because... His father and I were always trying to get hold of him. I would leave him numerous messages saying, Austin, please, you know, I love you. We want to help. What can we do? You know, so I think at every single point, and correct me if I'm wrong, you knew that your dad mm -hmm. and I were there. Mm -hmm. Right. Because sooner or later you're going to hit bottom. My, our biggest fear was, is he going to yeah. be alive? Right. right, exactly. From day to day, you know, and not, I knew my son was somewhere in Steamboat Springs, which is where we lived, right. but I didn't know where. Mm. That must have been heartbreaking yeah. for you as a parent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and I contacting his friends and right. nope, you know. Right. And feeling so helpless. I mean, you can't, what can you do? You can't mm -hmm. until you can't they do, realize. Right, right until, right, until you decide. Mm. And I've heard that from people, uh, you know, many people, I interviews and, you know, some forums that I've attended. It just, and it's hard for people to understand how does that happen to a person? How do you become so um, uh, reliant on a, you know, substance that it, it consumes your life, it takes over mm -hmm. your life to the point where you ended up, you know, living in a car. Mm -hmm. And I think that people don't understand that 
you do lose that control mm -hmm. because it does take that hold of mm -hmm. you and it's something that's uh, it's out of your control uh, you know and I think it's hard you know people there's a stigma with people when they say oh you know they're addicted or they've got you know whether in even with depression there's a stigma um, and so it's really it's really trying to help people understand that it's something that you didn't choose to become right. addicted right. it just happened to you mm -hmm. and there's a reason that it happened to mm -hmm. you I think some people are more susceptible to it um, in your instance, you said you were depressed, you were self-medicating, mm -hmm. so to speak, right. and it just escalated to that point. So it's really important for people, if someone, if you know somebody, right, and I'm going to you know, put this back on you, Austin, to elaborate, but if you know somebody that you see starting to go down that path, what would you say to them today, being, um, having walked this journey personally? I, I would say... Uh, I would I would do my best to sort of uh, convince them of you know the the consequences that will befall them because oftentimes you don't realize that the choices you make have consequences that extend far past that moment. Mm -hmm. I mean th th you can't even begin to comprehend, right? Because it's it's in the future. You think right. you think of the future as this distant movie that plays out at some point. You know? Right. Right. Um, so I would tell them that, but then I would also say don't underestimate another's capacity for forgiveness. Oh. Um, when you feel scared, when you feel like, boy, I'm, I'm tired, I just want to go home, I just want to, you know, you know, have a come, you know, come to Jesus moment with, with like a friend or a family member, mm -hmm. do it. Because they, nine times out of ten, they will, they will shock you. Because all they want for you is you to be happy and healthy. Um, so I, I've, I kind of go back to this, this movie quote that I really love uh, from the classic The Natural. And, and at one point, one of the characters says, everybody lives two lives, the life you learn with and the life you live after. And I think that for a lot of people, if they can turn their addiction into a learning opportunity, by, you know, reaching out to a person before, you know, it's too late, having the wherewithal to, to accept that you are an addict and, and that's not a defining label, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think once you do that, the future is so bright because, man, you have gained so much resilience. I mean, you'll look back at, at you know, the, the typical problems that people deal with um, when they're young and you go, oh, that's nothing. That's nothing, mm -hmm. you know. Even, even with the most recent um, difficulties that I've had getting a visa, um, just because it's a complicated process. Mm -hmm. um, I've been reminded several times that, boy, I've overcome, you know, tougher stuff than this. Right, you know? right. It puts it in perspective. Right, right. Good for you. That, that's perfect advice. Um, thank you so much for sharing that of with course, us. Of my pleasure. I appreciate that. And Delisa, from you as a mother, what would you say to another parent right now who might be going through what you went through with Austin? Would you have any advice or guidance? want to share? Yeah, I think um, two things. One, keep telling your child that you love them, that you are there for them. And even if they brush it off and they keep making mistakes, keep on telling them, do not give up hope. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing I would tell them is take care of yourself. Because if you're not taking care of yourself and being healthy yourself, like I got really into yoga and meditation at that time mm -hmm. because it allowed me to stay strong so that I could be strong and continue to try to, to con uh, contact my son, to try and help my son. And then also reach out to people who have been through similar um, situations mm -hmm. because then you have you have like a, a list, uh, somebody who understands what you're going through. Right. And again, there's no stigma. And I think that's one of the reasons I had mentioned to you that Austin and I we were more than happy to sit down so that people understand they are, we're out here to help. Right. So right. if there's ever anyone I can help, I want them to contact mm -hmm. me. Right. Right. That's excellent. Thank you so much. So many... Yeah. Um, good life lessons you shared with us today and I'm, it's been a pleasure getting to know you better Austin and I uh, sincerely appreciate you coming and um, sharing your story with us and I know it will certainly help other people and Delisa you as well yes thank you very much thank you thank you